One of the promises that I made when I started this show was that I would personally acknowledge legitimate criticism when it's thrown my way. This acknowledgement is one of the reasons that I do live Q&As right here on YouTube as well as on Twitter and Facebook, and even sometimes when people come up to me on the street. Not only do I genuinely like hearing from you directly, but I think it's important to hear the bad feedback right along with the good. Note I said legitimate criticism there and not hysterical troll criticism. For example, I'm happy to hear from people who want me to ask questions differently or have more aggressive follow-ups or to find alternative guests or anything along those lines. Those qualify as legitimate criticism whether or not I agree with them. The people who just tell me that I'm a straight, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, alt-right racist, well, let's just say that I'm a little less likely to engage with you. The battle of ideas is far more interesting to me than the battle to be first to sarcastically respond to a tweet. One criticism that I hear occasionally is that I'm actually not a real liberal and I'm secretly a conservative. Or sometimes they'll say I'm the only thing worse than a conservative, a dreaded right winger. Now it is true that I've been saying for months that defending my liberal principles is now a conservative position. But am I still a liberal? Do I still believe any of the things that people on the left believe? Well, since we have so many new subscribers around here, I thought I'd lay out some of my liberal cred for you in case you missed it. I'm so for gay marriage that I even married a guy. I'm pro-choice, I'm against the death penalty, I'm for a social safety net, I'm for a strong public education system, I'm for legalizing marijuana, I'm for reforming our prison system, and I'm against unnecessary wars and nation building. There's other stuff too, but I'm pretty sure I just made my point right there. Beyond any of those specific issues though, I'm for true tolerance of opinion and thought. My liberalism is one of a live and let live attitude. This of course is where I diverge from the modern left. I see virtually no diversity of thought or tolerance of other opinions on the left today, just constant smearing and slandering of all intellectual opponents. Take a step back for a moment and think about your friends on the left. Are they tolerant of people who aren't for gay marriage or of people who are pro-life? These used to be just political differences and now they are somehow a referendum on what type of person you are and whether you can be in someone's life at all. I wish this intolerance was an isolated case, but not only have I seen this type of intolerance firsthand in my life, but I hear it from you guys every single day. I get emails about marriages breaking up, lifelong friends no longer talking to each other, and people afraid to say what they think politically because of repercussions it'll have at work. And by the way, now let me reverse that. Do you know people on the right who are tolerant of people who are for gay marriage and who are pro-choice? I actually do, plenty of them, including several people who I've had on this show. When there's a disagreement, I see way more people on the right, conservatives or libertarians, more often willing to agree to disagree rather than to defriend or to smear. Could the right be better? Are there real bigots on the right? Absolutely. And are there real racists on the right? Yes, of course, without question. But by and large, these aren't the voices from the mainstream right anymore. Let's not forget, even Donald Trump got a standing ovation at the Republican National Convention when he talked about protecting LGBTQ rights. Of course, all this said, it doesn't mean that things are all right with the right right now. Just in the last few weeks, Tommy Lahren was let go by the blaze after she came out as being pro-choice or at the very least giving a conservative explanation for abortion by saying that the government should stay out of a woman's private life. I actually agree with her rationalization here and know that that position upsets a lot of conservatives. The immediate reaction to her comments and her subsequent firing strike me as the same intolerance we're used to seeing from the left these days, not from the right. And for the record, I've invited Tommy on the show and I've invited Glenn Beck back on the show to discuss what went down between them. I hope that'll happen. I happen to like both of them and we all, all of us, have views that are inconsistent with our broader ideologies. We're not robots just yet, we're still human. Oh, and yes, by the way, it is Glenn's right as a private businessman to hire and fire people as he sees fit, even if I don't agree with the reason why he did it. 
You know, another area which I don't fit into the traditional political box is gun control. I absolutely believe in the Second Amendment and obviously also believe that a healthy distrust of the government is an important and key part of being an American. Democrats often make it sound like Republicans want every American wandering the streets with a weapon like we're in the old Wild West. And Republicans often make it sound like every Democrat wants to take away their right to self-defense. As for me, I believe that we have the right to bear arms, but also we have to keep these weapons out of the hands of the wrong people, and perhaps even more importantly, have a real discussion about mental health, which usually has more to do with these shootings than the weapon itself. As always, I'll keep talking about free speech, free expression, and the rights of the individual, which I believe to be the most important facets of a truly free society. Whether that makes me a libtard or a conservative or a right-wing maniac is for the commenters to decide. Joining me today is a commentator and YouTube creator who has been called the king of controversy and someone who, as of this moment, has been suspended by the Twitter, Tommy Sotomayor. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Well, thank you, Dave. All right, I guess we're gonna have to do this in over 140 characters because <laughs> uh, you're off the Twitter. Yeah, it's harmful, it's hurtful, it's sad. I don't know if I'll be able to make it till tomorrow, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are gonna do this in long form then. More right. than 140 characters, we'll see if we can do it. So now, we're taping this uh, probably about a week before it's gonna air, roughly. So there's a chance you're back on Twitter by the time this has happened, we don't know. Uh, what did you do to get kicked off? The king of controversy, what did you do? It must be your fault. Apparently what I did was respond to people who were talking to me or just sent out videos on my own Twitter timeline that the only way you should see it is if you either follow me or someone that follows you retweets it. Now, apparently that's something that makes people really sad about their day and it hurts them <laughs> and they can't have their coffee in the morning and the kids go to school, you know, like uh, Van Jones said, that the kids are at breakfast and don't know what to expect afterwards. Yeah. So they had to get rid of me in order to make those people's lives better. I don't really know. The, the story that I got from Twitter was this. Simply, I was making it a harassing place for other Twitter users which makes no sense because I don't really mess with other people, they mess with me. Yeah, so just to be clear, you're not out there hunting down people and picking fights and all that stuff. You're responding mm -hmm. to people who are going after you. Now in the most cases, you have more of a following than them, so somehow that then tricks people to think that you're the bully here, but that wouldn't be your take on it. No, and it's like, the biggest thing is YouTube does not protect, not YouTube, but uh, Twitter doesn't protect the content creators. If you do have that type of following, that means that you're generating traffic for them. That every time you say something, people want to see what you say, people want to retweet what you say, they want to watch what you post. But instead, they're allowing the small people, the trolls, to have the most power because you can just poke the bear, then the bear turns around and pulls his claws out, <laughs> yeah. the zookeeper comes in and shoots it down. Right. So now the bear's like, well, what am I, what am I supposed to do? Right, the bear's going, you let the kid in the cage. <laughs> Yeah, but, but you're a bigger bear, so you should understand. And in life, a lot of what we're doing is saying there's a group of society that's supposed to have more common sense and morality than another group. The other group can just run wild and we must protect them. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have with social media and America in general. Yeah, so that relates to a lot of the stuff that you do videos about. But before we get to that, for people who have no idea who you are, let's, there might be one or two people out there that don't know you. For those people, who are you? What, what made you get into this game of being public about what you, what you think? I grew up in an atmosphere of where I realized that having a single mom, and no man around, was the norm. But as I grew up, I also started to understand a lot of the children from those environments did not do well. They didn't do well in life. They didn't do well in relationships. They didn't do well in parenting. They just didn't do well because they couldn't function because they didn't see the dynamic of two people trying to make something happen. Because if you think about it, in a, in a single parent household, the person who's the single parent is a dictator. If they just don't want you to learn math, you won't learn math. <laughs> One of the greatest movies I love that addresses this is The Water Boy. Mm -hmm. The Water Boy had a single mom who decided to be lord over his life and wouldn't let him learn anything and, and wanted to basically ruin his life. Now she woke up at the end, but the whole part was, well, we got rid of the father and we don't need the father. And there's too many places out there where people say they don't need the father. So I wanted to address that because father's rights in America are none. Like no one cares that a father's put in jail for, paying, for not paying child support. 
but the woman can have a credit score of 200. So she owes everyone, but she doesn't go to jail for it. But this guy, who may have not wanted the child in the first place, when the woman gets the option to have the child. I just wanted to address a lot of things on, from a man's standpoint that a lot of people won't address. Yeah, all right, so let's pause on men's right for just a second. Waterboy, would you say that was Adam Sandler's last good movie? Because these last couple have been pretty freaking horrible. They have I know this been. Is a sidebar, but can you admit that? They have been, and the sad part was. <laughs> it is sad. It's watching him because you grew up with him and he's so funny, and now you're trying to convince people he's still funny and he's just not. It's like um, <laughs> the last Metallica album. You really wanted to get behind <laughs> it. But you realize it wasn't good, you're just a fan. <laughs> isn't, isn't that, there's something there about like just becoming a victim of your own success, right? Because those first Adam Sandler movies, I mean, to me, Billy Madison is almost a perfect comedy for the time it came out in, and mm -hmm. then a couple after that. But after Waterboy, these Netflix things, whew. Yeah, and then he did the little Nicky, that wasn't funny, Ugh. then Ugh. Spanglish was his trying to get into, that was actually, that was okay. actually good, yeah, yeah. It's like nobody took him seriously though, and then that last, few things he's done it's just it's sad to watch yeah all right moving past Adam Sandler we could probably do an hour on just Adam Sandler movies, yes but, but putting that aside so when did you actually wake up to that because that's a pretty powerful thing you're saying you came from a household where your mom was your mom was the dictator so to speak mm -hmm. were you 12 when you saw what was going on there or was this later into adulthood well here's a funny thing it's like um I'd say like the movie frequency where the guy had two memories he had one of where his father died, and he had one of where his father was alive because he was the only one that noticed that both happened. Everybody else's life had changed. Well, it's the same thing when you're growing up in a neighborhood where everyone else has a mom, which is a dictator, and it's a norm. When you watch the news right now, or watch the NBA draft, you will see some black guy get up there, and he'll say, thanks to my mom, it'll be a bunch of women stand up, and there will be no dad. His first thing they ask him, what's he gonna do with all his money is, I'm gonna take care of my mom and buy my mom a house. Now you never had to hear Peyton Manning say this because Peyton Manning had this thing called a father. His father bought his mom a house. A lot of black children, the males become the breadwinner. That's why you see so many young men out in the streets selling drugs, because they're trying to take care of and be the man that mom couldn't pick when he or she was had. And it's a sad dynamic and what happened with me was over time I started to hang around other people who had their fathers. I got lucky that we went from a bad neighborhood to middle class. And all of my white friends had their fathers. When we graduated, they would have their whole family. The few black people that went to the high school I went to, they all just had their mom, their aunt. And then I noticed that a lot of my white friends went on to be married, a lot of my black friends went on to repeat the cycle. We have children, we're not in the lives of the children, we have multiple mothers. We end up in jail. We end up with criminal records. We end up just not knowing how to survive in society. And I think probably when I was 30, I said, Some, somebody has to say something because this is ridiculous. Like nobody's pointing it out. But in one side of me, it was saying, but this is normal if you say this. Even my mom said, well, you're saying this and you're trying to make me look bad. And I thought, but it's what happened. I don't understand how we don't want to stop this cycle from repeating itself by having silence. It's the equivalent of having a molester in the house. Nobody wants to say we have a molester in the house because it'll make us look bad to the other people in the, the neighborhood or the community. Mm -hmm. So the molester keeps to go around and uh, keeps to, uh, keeps going out and um, molesting people and victimizing people. And the victims are the ones who have to be quiet to protect this so-called image that was never there in the first place. Yeah, how difficult is this stuff to talk about? I've done a little bit on men's rights on the show and I've had um, Cassie J, who did the Red Pill movie, and, and a couple other people, Karen Strawn on. I come from a family, my parents have been married over 40 years, and I, do, I don't think until the last few years I realized how actually important that is. When I, now since I, I grew up in New York, I moved away, now when I go home, and I go home still to the same home that I grew up in, the same community, the friends that they've had for 30, 40 years, kids that I was five years old with that now have kids themselves and all that stuff, that, that, that root, has meaning, but it's really hard to talk about this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Like when people, I, I, you see people bring this up on TV and, and people make it seem like it's about race. And it's not about race, mm -hmm. I don't think, and I suspect you don't think so either. But, it, but even for you as a black man, you're black, is that? that yeah, that's that, a rumor. That, that, that's that is correct, just be sure. But really, you know what I mean? Like even for you to talk about it, it, it feels like there's a racial component, but you haven't said anything racial really. You're just talking about the, the fact of what you saw. Yeah, and it is difficult to talk about because it affects the black community so much so 
that when you speak of it, they look at you and they say, well, you're condemning black people. Well, in essence, I am if you pull back the layers because that's the side that I know. Because like you said, your father and mom married 40 years and you've been able to see stability. Well, most of my friends haven't. Most of my friends are like myself. I'm 41 years old. I wake up every day and I'm trying to figure out how to be a man at 41 because I never saw one. I never saw how a man is supposed to be a father. I never saw how a man is supposed to be a husband. I just saw a female dictator and the female dictator could do no wrong. One of the biggest problems that I think when you have these women, especially when they're violent, because I grew up in a violent household, the women in our community believe in violence towards their children. That's the way to keep them out of jail, which doesn't work, but it's believed. Uh, there was a woman, a mother in Baltimore, and they called her the riot mom. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. when her son was out there with a mask on and she came and grabbed him and oh, hit him upside yeah, yeah, the head. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and all the white liberals were talking about how, how great horrible. this was. Yeah, yeah. And I said, how is that great? If this had been any parent from any other race, they would have thought that's abuse. First off, why is your child out there? Yeah. That's something you should have known. Number two, the mother was out there with the child. She just happened to see the child. Number three, the woman has six children. She lives in a bad neighborhood and she has six kids by six different dudes. But nobody wanted to address any of this. She's a good mom because she's on him. If she was really a good mom, one of the most important things a woman can do is pick the correct person to have the kid with. So we're allowing these women to just have kids with dudes who are in and out of jail, dudes who don't have jobs. But the only person that's being held responsible is the guy. Because, well, you didn't have a job when you had him living in your house and you let him impregnate you. But now that you got fallen out, let's put him on child support, even though he didn't have a job in the first place because you were supporting him. And then that just perpetuates more poverty, more yep. inability to, to get a good job, and you're, you can sort of never get ahead. So if you scale all this stuff back, what do you think is the fault for this? Where did this happen to the black family? Because it, it wasn't always like nope. this. So where, where do you go, how far do you have to go back to start making sense of how it got to this place? Great Society and LBJ, because right before the Great Society and LBJ, black people, as far as couples and families, kids born in wedlock, I think it was 92% in around the early 60s. It dropped in the 70s to around 50%, and now only 24% of black children are born in, in wedlock. The number is astounding. And yeah. you look at right there where they ta started telling black women, well, if you work with the state, if you have children and there's no man there, we'll compensate you. I think one of the craziest things that we have right now is we help families less than we help single moms. So what you're doing if you have a child, say if you have four kids, if you have one who you pay the most attention to because they're getting into dirt and the one that's a straight A student, you decide they know what they're doing. Well, the straight A student will start to become a little jealous because you're not paying them as much attention. So they'll start to degrade mm -hmm. to become closer to that when they get your attention. Imagine if you're doing that with black single moms. They're getting money, they're getting places to stay. I don't know if you saw the black woman who said, I got 15 kids and somebody gonna help me take care of these kids. Oof. And they actually bought her a house a month later because she got on the news yeah. saying, somebody's gonna help me take care of these kids that I laid down and got because I'm a woman and it's my body, I can do what I want to with it. But once I do it, I need help. And that's what bothers me because men don't get a chance to do that. Men don't get a chance to say, it's my body, I can do what I want to, but when I get in trouble, I'm gonna need you to help me out. How much of this is just compounded by white liberal guilt, do you think? Because th this is something I talk about, that, that liberals have gone crazy. I, I would argue it's mostly, it's really progressives and the left, not what true liberals are. Mm -hmm. But that liberal guilt in general just enables this stuff. That because we're so afraid to talk about anything because it will come off as racist or bigoted or any of that stuff, that we just perpetuate this cycle. Mm -hmm. I have Well-meaning people, you know what I mean? I don't think they're bad people. That, that's the most important part. I don't think for the most part they're, they're, there are people of course who have bad intentions, but I think for the most part they don't and they're doing something bad. I think the people in power have bad intentions. I yeah. think the people that follow see uh, a magnanimous behavior and it looks like a good thing and yeah. yes we, we owe these people and I started a movement called guiltless I wanted white people to stop feeling bad for because when you look at something like Ebonics Ebonics was a white person saying well they'll never get English so we'll just say that what they're speaking is a normal language so they can continue to speak it 
Meanwhile, you have Jose or Paco, <laughs> whose family just ran across the Rio Grande uh, 10 years ago, yeah. speaking perfect English. There is no reason for us to have the issue if we've been here in America since pretty much the white people were here. We've been here at the same time. So at a certain point in time, you have to view your shortcomings by what haven't you done? Because we can't hold anybody hostage to what they did in the past. You, I don't know one white person who's personally benefited from owning my ancestors who were slaves. I don't know this person. Now, if it is, then I'll ask them for the money they owe me. But <laughs> until then, <laughs> now if, if I'm looking your past. Yeah, no, no, there's, there's <laughs> nothing. You can look. There's nothing. But because of Northeast. that. Northeast. We're all from the Northeast. <laughs> but because of that, we have to start saying, okay, where are we going to level the playing field now? Everybody just starts here. Yeah. Because that's true equality. But right now, black people, because of liberals, we're not asking for equality. We're just asking for handouts. We're saying we deserve it even though the people who fought, died, and marched for it would not want this. This is not what they were asking for. Dr. Martin Luther King was not asking for a handout. He was just asking for the opportunity to be treated as an equal citizen. Yeah. And right now, that's not what you're getting when you see a fire department have to hire three blacks, even though the three blacks have a lower test score than the other whites because we have to meet a quota. Yeah. And it, in some ways, that then also degrades the services, yep. right? Because if you're allowing people in, whether it's a fire department or a school or medical school, whatever it might be, if you're letting people in with lower grades because of race, it doesn't have to be just black, whatever the race is, mm -hmm. well, you're actually causing people that are less qualified to be at certain things, and then the, the services, the actual operation you might get. Have you could, been could through TSA in Atlanta? Uh, <laughs> one time, actually. Well, I've only been to Atlanta once. I was there, yeah. Well, then you'll see I've been the to JFK. I got you. Well, then you'll see the degradation of service. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. You go somewhere, and the government, uh, black women make up, I think it's 7% or 6%, 6 to 7% of society. In government, they make up around 10% of the jobs. Why is that? Then they put them in these jobs. We can't get rid of them. And no, most of the time, you go to these places, you're getting horrible service. And, and to... To look at black society right now, that it's a foregone conclusion that all racists believe if you have a black server at a restaurant, you're gonna get bad service. Now that's just a thought that you think of, but you look at other communities. You think of Jews will say, well, my kids are gonna grow up to be a doctor or a lawyer. Well, as black people, what we're telling our kids to grow up to be into entertainment, to grow up to be a football player, which is less than 1% of society can do this thing. Mm -hmm. But you're telling your kids the only way out is this way. So what happened to the educated black? What happened to going to school and getting your education? Even at the end of the water boy, you listen to what he said when he was supposed to be going pro. He said, no, 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 I'm gonna go and get my degree first. And these are things that are uh, missing in our community because I can't remember the last person who said, your degree matters. When I, got, when I told my mom I was accepted to college, she told me, that's great, I don't know how you're gonna pay for it. So for 18 years, hmm. she didn't, collect $10 a year, $15 a year, something to send. And that's, my story is the story of the majority of black children. We go to college and it's like, psh, figure it out. If you go, and I've seen black children get discouraged by their parents to not go because they're like, well, I can't help you pay for it. And if you look at what white liberals do, they're continuing to tell these mothers who are producing these children in bad environments, like the black mother in Chicago who had five of her sons, all five of her sons, were murdered in the same neighborhood. They did a whole story about her and they were boo-hooing and saying how horrible it was for her. But wait a minute, she knew she lived in basically Chirac. She knew that was a bad neighborhood. She knew it was dangerous for boys. After the first, Dave, if after the first one of your children got killed in the neighborhood, what would you do? Yeah, you'd get moving. You'd move. Yeah. And she stayed there long enough for four more to be, to be killed. And white liberals don't stand up and say, well, that's irresponsible. They'll say, oh, it's because those poor blacks, they don't have any money and we just need to throw more money at them. Well, no, you don't. You need to throw responsibility towards them. You need to say, wait a minute, if you are a woman and you're looking at the world and saying, my body, I can do what I want. Well, once you started having all these kids with all these people who couldn't afford to take care of them, nor could you, we're not gonna help either. Why do we not have a system that says, if you have one child and you're on government assistance, you cannot have another one. Why is that considered wrong? Yeah. 
I mean, I think there's issues related to personal freedoms and all that and what the government gives out, but I, the, the basic idea of what you're saying, I, I get there. I'm, you know, you mentioned something interesting about that what the black community is doing is, is saying, you know, we should win Emmys or, you know, be in entertainment or in sports or that kind of thing. And, you know, there was that whole Oscar is so white thing. I had on Reva Martin, who was actually for, you know, diversifying the Oscars more. And then I had Larry Elder, who I suspect you probably agree with a lot more, saying how ridiculous it was. But to me, it's like just ha winning more Oscars or more Emmys or having more people in sports has nothing to do with success. There's a reason why Chinese Americans and Indian Americans, meaning people from India, not Native Americans, they don't care about that stuff and they don't protest it because they are busting their asses in school and that has to come from the home. And th so their eyes, basically their eyes are on the right prize, not the prize that the liberals want you to think is the right prize. If only we had the exact amount of people winning Oscars, everything would be equal. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a really hard thing to extricate from which, society. Which doesn't make sense because if the same amount of people who are black were winning awards just like white people, white people should complain because white people have more people in the United States, so the numbers wouldn't bear it out. Why would only third, white people should complain about the NBA. I'd get tired Trust of being me, a I white I wanted guy. to be in the NBA. Right, I'd get tired of being a white guy turned on this television with my two white sons, and we're watching all these black guys run up and down, and my kids thinking, well, I can't be that. Yeah. How fair is that? Now, had this been the NBA and it been a bunch of, bunch of white people, black people would have said, well, they're keeping black people out because they just don't want us in there. Yeah. But when we're overrunning it, we're like, yeah, that's because we're better than you. Yeah. If we won all the Oscars, there would be no black people saying, well, that's kind of messed up that no white people won when we'd be like, yeah, because we're better than you. <laughs> Trust me, my hero is right there. <laughs> Clyde Drexler, 80s, 90s basketball star. I wanted to be him. I realized the skill set was not there <laughs> to go ahead and be Clyde. But another hero of mine was Bill Cosby. Now, I know even by bringing up Bill Cosby, it's very sad state when your childhood hero becomes the biggest serial rapist of all time. But putting aside rape first, putting aside that whole thing for a second. If we can. If, if we can. <laughs> if we can. Maybe, maybe we can. We'll find out. But to me, Cosby did something incredible. He put on the black family yes. that I think you wanted to see, right? That even though you're acknowledging that just what gets to television isn't supposedly the magic answer to all this, but he enabled black people and white people also to see a middle-class family. He was a, a obstetrician or a gynecologist. His wife was a lawyer. They were all successful. They had the same struggles that everybody else had. Uh, it didn't end well for Cosby, but do you credit him with doing some good there, look, looking back? Yes, and what happened was the liberals were the main people who got at him because of what he stood up and said to uh, this black audience. He said, blacks need to take care of education instead of going out and buying Jordans, and black women need to stop having a bunch of children that they can't take care of. That was the end. How dare you say something about the sacred cow in the black community, the black woman. When I was a child, you could get into a fight with someone just because they said, yo mama. They didn't have to say anything about <laughs> yo mama. But, just start the sentence. Right, just yo mama. Uh, but there's no such thing as yo daddy. If someone had said something about my daddy, I would have been like, you know him? I would have been more surprised that they said something <laughs> about this guy. I, I've never seen a yo daddy fight. Yeah. So Bill Cosby, put in front of America. Like you said, the black people were able to look at a fully functional family because in the 80s we didn't have it. The crack had started to destroy the black family after the whole great society. Mm -hmm. You had this man showing civility and manhood and being a man in his house and most of us didn't see it. And you also had white people saying, well maybe all the black people aren't like what we're seeing on the news because here's a different set. Because a lot of white people's only interaction with black is either through music or through television. Mm -hmm. That's it. So why not have this positive view? Well, I also remember when I was growing up and the Cosby Show was on, I remember black people turning against the Cosby Show saying, well, that ain't real, that ain't real, yeah. we wanna keep it real. So what they started to do was give black people what they asked for, real, dysfunction, love and hip hop, uh, housewives, well, the women were never wives, they were just women that got knocked up. <laughs> yeah. But uh, drink throwing in each other's faces and fighting in the middle of the streets and world star hip hop now, that's the black family. How do you separate then the artist from the art? This is a bit of a sidebar here, but Cosby, I'm with you on all that. I love that show. I mean, I, he was my hero from when I was five years old. I went into stand-up when I saw his first special. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. So he's doing what you argue is a great thing. And now I guess it is a transition to the rape part. He was also doing something pretty horrible to the black family because he was part of a black family at the same time. And his son struggled with drugs and, 
and all that stuff, and was was killed. I think maybe in a drug deal. I, I'm not. Was it a drug deal? That he was I can't killed? remember. I, exactly. I'm not. I'm I just not know he was shot. I can't yeah. remember exactly. Um, but this is a little bit of a sidebar. But separating the art from the artist is tough, right? Because he did so much good, and then at the same time was doing something horrible. Well, liberals have no problem doing it with Roman Polanski. Yeah, they celebrate him, and he raped. He raped and drugged a 13 year old. Um, what Bill Cosby is al alleged to do, my thoughts on it usually makes people upset because I say this. If you are a woman and you knew he was doing this to you, and there's generations of these women, you had an ethical and a moral responsibility to stop the man before he did it for 20 more years. Yeah, but a lot of them didn't know. I mean, he was bringing back young actresses who didn't, they would have a drink and then, you know, assuming all this stuff is true. And mm -hmm. again, it's, uh, all right, we, we don't have to go too far into that. But you know, like, as neither one of us are, are lawyers privy to every bit of the- Right, I just want people, if you're going through yeah. it, I look for the person to stand up and you, say, no more, I don't want it to happen to anyone else. Because you do understand that the reason why a lot of these rapists, molesters, get away with what they're doing is because the people who it happened to feel sheltered and they feel like they can't go out and, and speak, so they don't, or they don't want to, especially like what happened with Penn State, those were men. Mm -hmm. And we're not as outraged about Penn State as we are about these actresses who were trying to get something from Bill Cosby. Those kids were just children, but because they were males, we don't care about them. We don't care about all the males in jails to this day. We make jokes about them going to jail and getting raped getting violated, we would never make this joke. Just like when Sharon Osbourne got on television and made the joke about the man who got his penis cut off and thrown inside of the uh, food processor, she thought it was hilarious. Have you ever seen anyone make a joke about a mutilated woman on national television and continue to keep their job? The only person who I can ever think of making a joke about female genital mutilation actually is Linda Sarsour, who is thought of as a hero of the left. You know, she's the woman that uh, led the the women's march and all that, and she's mocking Ayan Hirsi Ali, who literally underwent female genital mutilation. So that does show you a little of the perverseness of this whole situation. Hey, but as a man, and especially as a white man, like, you can't make any joke. Like, as a comedian, it's <laughs> funny because you're like, well, what can I say that won't get me in trouble? As a black man, I get on stage and say anything. As a black woman, you have, you're limitless. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I don't know that I've even said this publicly. I used to say this in stand-up, but I would know when I was really in the thick of stand-up for many years in New York, that if I could get, if there was a, ta you know, mostly, a, usually the audience was pretty diverse ethnically, but if there was a table of black people, if I could get them to laugh, everyone else would laugh. And if I said anything remotely politically incorrect, you could feel white people kind of looking like that. <laughs> if they laugh, it's they're, okay to laugh. Then I'm okay. <laughs> so I did consciously, I would do that. And I also found that in general, black audiences are great because there's a realness there and a rawness there. And what, they don't, they, you know, I remember I was on stage once telling some stupid joke, like some joke about the Transformers or something, and some girl, a black girl up front goes, you corny. <laughs> like she said, you corny. And from that point forward, it changed what I was doing. Because I was like, wait a minute, am I just telling corny jokes up here? And so, but that even goes to the guilt thing, that white people yep. are sitting there, black person left, okay, this is funny. Like, mm -hmm. man, we're in a weird spot. Well, when I did comedy, I did it too for three years, and it was just some of the hardest thing to do, because it's real work. Because yeah. you have to work for them. And I, I said this the same thing that you said. When I was dealing with white audiences, it was better for me because... Well, they would encourage you to, because they already pay. <laughs> so if you bombed, oh, you'll get the next yeah. one. <laughs> but the black people came in ready to boo. You had to convince them to laugh. Yeah. So it almost became contentious. But I was like you. I was like, if there's a black table, I'm going to make them laugh. Because if yeah. they laugh, everyone else will laugh. But if I make everyone else laugh and they don't, they're going to shut it down. <laughs> they're yeah. they're going to get me off of this stage. And it's a strange dynamic. But again, goes back to how the liberals are telling blacks to just be disruptive. Look at what's going on throughout the United States. There are more people, black women, black people, who are making petitions, you can look online, to ban me from the internet. Yeah. Then there are petitions to ban the murder that's going on in Chicago. You don't see black women upset with that, but you'll see black women upset with a with a some celebrity dating a, a non-black woman. This will be front page news. But these murders that are happening every weekend in one small area is is normal. It's not uh, it's not march worthy. It's not protest worthy. It's not we can shut this down worthy. No, we can deal with these black kids killing each other as long as no cop comes and does it. Right, right, so that, so I see this all the time. You'll see people on, say, Fox News, and they'll talk about what's going on with the cops, and then, like, Hannity will say, well, but nobody's talking about what's happening in Chicago. 
and you know thousands of people have been shot in Co Chicago over the last couple of years. Hundreds have been killed. I mean, it's it's crazy. It has a Democratic mayor, by the way. Yep. Most most of these cities with these inner city problems are Democratic mayors. They're, and then there were people out in the street blaming Trump, who wasn't even president at the time, and it's going, your mayor's Democrat, the president's Democrat. Okay, uh, <laughs> but do you think that's a little bit of a shell game? Because I don't know that the Republicans have done. Uh, I, I, are, do you consider yourself a Republican? Uh, what do you consider yourself? I'm I, probably I, more of a libertarian, but they put me on the Republican side. I voted for Trump. Um, I will vote my conscience. I'm not one of those people that will go into there and then I'm all liberal or I'm all conservatives. I don't think that anyone should do that, number one. And number two, we don't teach American citizens that their local elections matter more than the presidential election. But that's the only time they'll come out during the presidential election. That's the only time they care when they're being told to care. Well, where are all these liberals trying to bust them to vote for their mayor, to vote for their tax commissioner, to vote for all of these other things? The uh, people in Ferguson complained about the police force was so white, yet they could have raised their kids to grow up to want to apply. The white people were like, we took who applied. Those people were told that they don't want to grow up to be cops, that they hate cops. So this whole neighborhood of black people didn't decide to raise their children up to say, well, if we don't want to be policed by whites, why don't you go and apply for the job? Nope. It's better for you to be some kind of dancer or a rapper because that'll get us out quick. Most of what black society, because there's no fathers in the home, you spoke earlier about how, it's, how things are being taught to the children who are Chinese or uh, Indian. Well, the difference is when you have a father, a father will teach you the slow and steady route instead of the get rich quick scheme. Women are the ones who do this thing called sugar baby. Women are the ones who are online and will have booking information on their um, IG, but the booking is actually oh, if you I got enough it. money. <laughs> right. So women are doing this. You don't yeah. see many men able to get up there and be like, hey, look at me and these Speedos <laughs> if you want it. So we can't do that. So we kind of have to work. Yeah. Um, a pretty woman can get way more than a pretty man can get. That being said, as a father, when you have one in the house, he's not gonna teach his kid get rich quick schemes. Take that man out, all you have is a person who's living off of the government, whose mere existence becomes, and I said this about black women, people got mad when I said it, I said, at their child's birth, they typically get paid, and then at their child's death, they get paid. You understand as a young girl who got hit by a train, I don't know if you saw the story, she was modeling, she got hit by a train while she was modeling. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the 20 year, the 19 year old girl was on the train tracks modeling and they talked about how intelligent she was and she had a volleyball scholarship, but she decided to forego the volleyball scholarship to chase her dream of modeling. Now, I'm not a great eye for talent, but she was not <laughs> model material. She wasn't. She could do urban modeling, which everybody knows that's completely different. That's mm -hmm. no face back shot. But, she was on this train, she got hit doing a free job, and when she got hit, they said, it's a shame, she just found out she was four weeks pregnant. So let me get this straight. She forgo, she forgo college because she felt that it would get in the way of her modeling career. But being a parent is okay. Yeah. I can have a kid and still model. And that's the logic that's being taught by the liberals to the blacks, that being irresponsible is okay. Now, when she died, this woman claimed to, well, they threw out that her boyfriend was her fiance. We had no evidence of that, no ring, no nothing. But what were they looking for? Go fund me. So every time a black kid like the one in, New, uh, the one in uh, Chicago who got shot seven times across the test, mm -hmm. Tasha Lee, execution style, mom gets um, go fund me money. She goes and buys a car and goes on vacation in Vegas because she knows she can do it again. She could have another kid, and then now I can put another guy on child support, ruin his life, and get money from the state, and continue to live in this same poor environment, but I'm used to it because there have been generations of poverty. So yeah. poverty doesn't affect us. We're used to it. So what do you make of the people, I would argue someone like an Al Sharpton, who have become, uh, you probably answered it already with the slight nod of the head, uh, who have become really sort of professional agitators in this. That for all of the activism that he has done for these years, and for on the behalf of the Democrats, things have only gotten worse. So what does that tell you? While, while he's gotten richer, and by the way, I'm pretty sure he doesn't pay his taxes, but that's a whole other thing. That's right. Well, the thing is, they've created victims out of black people. Saw a video today before I came here. Black woman, and it's starting to become worldwide now. Black Lives Matter, I have a friend, uh, he does music, Pogo. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, he's mute music lives in um, Perth, Australia. Mm -hmm. And he says, Black Lives Matter is here and it doesn't even make any sense. 
<laughs> it's like black people all over seeing what American blacks are doing and getting away with it. So this story, this woman is at this uh, eating dinner and her children are beating this little white kid. So finally the father, because of course it's just a woman and her kids, no man, mm -hmm. but this white guy and his family were watching their kid get beat by her kid. So he's like, why wouldn't you stop your kid? So he gets animated and she gets animated. She's cursing him out, telling him he doesn't tell her what to do. And the next thing you know, she starts yelling, is it because I'm black? Is it because I'm black? <sighs> and the people in the comment section was like, yeah, that racist white man. I was like, he would have done that if anybody was beating his kid. Yeah. The thing you should ask is the parent, because you can't beat the kid, but you can ask the parent, why are you allowing this? Why is this okay? And yet people skip the fact that this man was taking up for his children. It was he's racist because he's speaking to that woman and becoming animated. And that's what Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton is doing. They're creating victim, victimhood, victimology, to where if you don't get your way, then you're a victim. You're only saying this because I'm black. You can get horrible service from a black waitress, but you can't say anything about it like the other black waitress. You know how many of these, um, and I have so much going through my mind, but you know how, how many of these situations that's happened over the past year and a half where it was these black people who were being mistreated by white people and you found out they were hoax? They were being placed on Donald Trump. Look at what Donald Trump's election is doing. This woman was written a tip. We don't tip blacks. Come to find out, she wrote that herself. The other one said, uh, thanks, thanks, nigger. Uh, uh, no thanks, nigger. We won't be leaving a tip. That was written down. The, the other black woman. stickers in the bathroom. All made all up. All made up. The, yeah. There was a black woman who actually cut herself and set herself on fire and, it, and was trying to make white people look bad. Look at what happened with the Duke lacrosse case. Al Sharpton was there. Where was he when we found out that it was a lie? I'm guessing to one not Brown, there. To one of Brown, yeah. they still bring her up knowing it was a lie. Yeah. Where were those liberals after they realized, where was Al Sharpton? Nowhere to be found, because he wants you to be a professional victim. He's an ambulance chaser. He's only telling black people to feel bad and think everything is racist. He's never telling them to build their own. If he really cared about blacks, why wouldn't he just say, well, instead of complaining, build your own. If the masters won't let you in, they have golf courses, places you can build golf courses all over the place. We have all these well-off black people and actors and whatever. They can build their own. Because right now, we want to get awards on TBS and, and NBC and whatever while we still have black entertainment TV. But if there was a white entertainment TV, how far would that go? If there was a white NBA, if right now white people say, well, we can't get in the NBA, so let's just make our own, <laughs> we'd still call that racist. Yet we have a WNBA where women are allowed to go and play and keep men out. Right. White NBA, that sounds terrible. <laughs> That's a lot of mid-range jump shots. That's it. Nobody, it would be fun to be on sound. Yeah, nobody, I mean, for my own future, maybe it would be nice, but, you know, it doesn't sound... It'd be, a, it'd be the WNBA with an occasional would dunk. It, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> There'd be more dunks in the WNBA, I think, but there's a couple of girls that can dunk now. Um, when you, how hard is it to wake people up to this stuff? Because uh, people know this, I've mentioned it a couple times on the show. When I had Larry Elder on the first time, who's, who says a lot of the same things that you're saying, and he's really, I think he's an incredibly good interview and, and you know, lays out numbers, doesn't mm -hmm. just make shit up, he lays out numbers. When I had him on the first time, I definitely had not come around on a lot of this stuff that I now obviously agree with you on. And, uh, and he really challenged me on, and I said, there's systemic racism, and, he, and, and then he turned it on me. I didn't expect him to. And it was not a particularly good moment for me, but we didn't edit it out because I wanted my audience to see that I don't have all the answers. Subsequently, Larry's been back on the show. We're now friends, and I think we've, uh, I credit him for a lot of my awakening. Nice. So when you're doing this, work, this is work, what you're doing. When you're doing this, how hard is it to deal with members of the black community who maybe don't want you to expose that stuff that you said before, you know, it's like, we gotta just, it may be true, but we gotta keep it quiet. I've gotten death threats. I continue to get death threats. They put out my address, they put out my phone number. We have people dedicated right now. Someone says, we're gonna make sure he's broke. We're gonna make sure they take away his house and his car, and we're gonna have him back in the hood where he deserves to be. All because of my opinion. Now, you have to understand, my own mom thought that what I was doing was wrong, because she said, well, you shouldn't be airing black people's dirty laundry. And you hear that a lot in the black community, that it's our dirty laundry and you shouldn't be airing it. As if no one knew that the poverty existed. No one knew that the murder existed. Like, the news will talk about the murder in Chicago, but if I take one of those clips and talk about this systemic part of that murder, well, then I'm a coon. Mm -hmm. I get called these names that blacks know that whites use to degrade blacks, but blacks want to be in position 
to do that. A lot of people yeah, don't understand. Because you're getting this from people on the left, right? Like yep. most of these people, they, they think of themselves as liberals or lefties, yep. and they're mm -hmm. the ones slinging this horrible shit at you, which I see they do with Larry, and they've done with uh, my friend Majid Nawaz, who's Muslim, trying to reform Islam to bring it into the, the current century, and they, who gives them shit? The left. That so-called tolerant left. They're supposed to be tolerant enough to have a discussion, and they don't even understand how to have a discussion. It's a name-calling session. It is a shaming tactic. And that's what a lot of blacks will do to black people. They will shame you. They will, you you're worried about being called a sellout. You're worried about being called a coon. You're worried about being called a race traitor. You're worried about so much of these things because they will ruin your career that you can't go um, the company, the company line, you have to toe that party line. And that party line is blacks are perpetual victims. They're always a victim no matter what happened, we are victims of it. Even when we kill ourselves, we're a victim of society wanted us to do it and we just couldn't not do it, even though they claim now that they're dropping guns off in these neighborhoods. So the black people aren't smart enough not to shoot each other with the guns or see them land in the street, they gotta shoot each other. Uh, they gave us drugs. Well, we weren't smart enough not to take them. At a certain point in time, responsibility needs to be taught. And because I'm teaching responsibility, I become an enemy to a whole lot of people who are making money or living comfortably. Yeah, it's a threat to them. You know the phrase, the soft bigotry of low expectations, yep. which was a phrase that uh, people credit uh, to Bill Maher, but it was actually originally from George W. Bush. And that's what's happening here. It's the soft bigotry of low expectations. It's like when you say, well, if we draw a cartoon of a certain thing, these people are obviously savages, so they're gonna kill us. And you're, you're dealing with the same thing uh, in your community. It's that these, the soft bigotry of these liberals is keeping people that are, all you've said here for the entire time is you've basically made one theme, personal responsibility. That's it. And that's what America is supposed to be about. Well, that's where we're changing with this whole idea of feminism. Feminism is allowing these women to still ask you to be chivalrous and pay for dates and stuff like that. They're asking you not to hit a woman, but she can level off and hit you because you're bigger than her. It goes back to the whole animal in the cage thing. Uh, as a black person, I can call you all kinds of names right now, and it would never stop me from getting on any other show. I can call you all kind of crackers, whitey, whatever. If you say one thing and respond back in kind, Tommy L uh, Laren was having that problem. They could say whatever they wanted to to her. Call her all kind of white bitches. If she responds to any black woman and says, well, you're a black bitch, just in response, mm -hmm. she's immediately racist. So what you've done is tongue-tied this person yeah. so that they can't respond back to you and it made you more aggressive. It's basically like, the, I don't know if you remember, there was always a kid that had a bigger brother. <laughs> Because his yeah. big brother would always take up for him, he put his big brother in position to have to. Yeah, yeah. Because he had big brother behind him. Same thing with a lot of people with guns. If they have a gun on them, they become a tough guy. A lot of these women are becoming tougher, not easier to deal with, because you have so many people backing them up. The guy on the bus, he was spit on and hit in the back of the head while driving the bus. He pulls over and he hits the woman. Everybody jumped up to her defense and said, that's a female. Yeah. So it was okay for this female to hit the man driving this bus full of people. He could have crashed, but he should take it because he's a man. Right now, I say something to you, Dave. Men die about 10 to 15 years earlier than women. Life expectation. If this was reversed, there would be all types of commercials saying, we got to get <laughs> these women's life expectancy up. Yeah. Right now, you have yeah. big, strong football players who, when they get old, guess what they will probably suffer from? Right. Prostate cancer. Yeah. Guess what they won't suffer from? Breast cancer. But in October, they're walking yeah. around decked out in pink. But in November, they don't have on blue. This is a society that we're pushing. That males do not matter. They're just an ATM machine. They're a source of income. And whenever white people get a cold, it's because black people had the flu. So that means that if it's starting to hurt your community, it's devastated ours. Black people are, the, are America's canary in a coal mine. If you see it happening to us, it's coming to you. So what would you say to the people, and I probably should have asked you this maybe 20 minutes ago, because I think a lot of people have watched this and go, all right, guy's making a lot of sense, but there was a time when racism was systemic. So I'm sure you would argue that, you, you believe that there are racists, today, yes. right? That racism exists, a certain amount of people don't like you uh, because you're black, period. And a certain yep. amount of people don't like Asian people or gay people or Muslim people or whatever. Okay, there are bigots out there. Now it's not built into the system anymore, but do, does the system, owe anything to black people for past grievances, for the fact that most black people that are here were brought here, not voluntarily. I do think they owe, but how would you figure it? How would you figure this out? 
I think they owe because I see what they did to the Jews. And they're continually paying them in their generations. If you don't pay this group, but you will pay that one, then you have to explain why. Wait, you're talking why. about like, like Germany like what happened uh, to Germany. reparations yeah. to, to Jews after the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. so okay. if that can happen, if what happened with the uh, Japanese who were interred here in a little while, they were compensated. Mm -hmm. The Indians were compensated. Black Americans have to be compensated for, for something, I would assume, mm -hmm. but then the logistics of it. Who pays what, where does it go, who actually had lineage, because if I'm not mistaken, only two to eight percent of whites actually owned slaves. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like everybody had slaves. So where do you, how do you calculate this money and who actually gets it? Because not every black person that's in America came from a slave either. And is there, is there also an inherent problem that even if you did that, which I agree, it would be a, an undertaking that would be beyond imagination. It'd be a but, let's, nightmare. but let's say you could figure it out and you could get some consensus on it, not that we can get consensus on anything in America, <laughs> but let's say we get some consensus on it and people said, okay, this is basically right. Is the other problem that it actually feeds exactly what you've been talking about is the biggest problem here, which is, all right, you throw money at it. You don't know what people are gonna do with their money. They'd be entitled to do whatever they want with it. Some people are gonna buy a car. Some people are gonna waste it on booze. Some people might invest it in education and all that. But that you actually didn't solve a problem. You just sort of, you enriched victim culture, which I know sounds terrible in a situation like this, but that's kind of what you're doing. Yeah, Dave Chappelle's skit did it perfectly. I don't know if you've ever seen the skit where he was showing the blacks got reparations. <laughs> oh, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cadillac <laughs> sales went through the roof. And it was all, um, Ridiculous money thrown at ridiculous stuff. If you think about the black community, I think they did a study, and the GDP of blacks in America, if they separated out and became their own country, it would be the ninth wealthiest country on the planet. So that means there's a lot of money going through the hands of black people in America. They can't say it's not. When they can spend $10 billion a year on weave alone. <laughs> on weave? I swear to God. $10 billion? $10 billion a year. In Jamaica, it's a $1 billion industry, and they're poor. So you have women. Right now, you will see women on Instagram, and they all look like they're rich because they all got their weave in their hair, and they all do out. There was a woman during the riots of Philando Castile who was shot by the police. His girlfriend was there, and she says, stop burning. CNN did the whole they didn't oh, play what I was know, actually I saw this said. Video. Unbelievable. Right. So they made it seem like she was a victim when she was saying, go after white people. Yeah, which but they, they cut, cut that part out. They cut. <laughs> yeah, wait. Can we, let's just lay that out real quick. Can you just lay it out real quick for people that didn't see it? And we'll, we'll put a link to it below because it's, it's unbelievable what they yeah, did. Yeah, I, I did this video and they cut out the part where she was saying, go after white people, go after white businesses. We need to go after white people. This is during the riots. During she's the riots. And this. she's standing up. So she's inciting a riot against white people. Yeah. CNN had the footage, 100% of the footage. They cut it to where it looked like she's calling for peace, but that isn't what she was calling for. She was saying, as black people don't do anything to each other in our quote unquote stuff, let's go do it to the white people. And stuff. they literally cut at the end of that mm -hmm. sentence. Oh, and they made her out to be a, 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 a benevolent figure at this point. Uh, even though she's grieving from her, the loss of her companion, she's causing, calling for peace. But that isn't what she was doing. But one of the funniest things she said was, we need our shit. We need our weave. And I keep playing that back and forth. Because, like, what person says this? This is a mother. These are women. And if you look at most riots or most of these so-called, this guy got shot or killed by the police, if you look on the streets, it's a bunch of women. Now, where do all these women come from? All these, sing all these cities where this violence is, is overrun by single black mothers who are raising these children in these environments. So nobody's going to point out that single black mothers in almost every violent city across the United States overwhelmingly are raising the children. That would be an immediate link. If you had a link to where every um, police chief in every one of these cities were white and all of the educators were white and the kids were dumb and violent, we would say, well, look who's over them. But we won't do it when it comes to liberal run cities and single mother run neighborhoods. We will not point out that that one link is everywhere. And why? CNN helped perpetuate it. That's why I don't like liberals, because they're perpetuating the victimhood, like you said, the low expectations. Yeah. They're telling them, hey, ah, you know, the SAT is culturally biased. Yet Sue Young, who was eight <laughs> years old when she came over here, yeah. aced it. How can people who've been here for 400 years, if you've been under the thumb of white people, the one thing you should know is the culture of white people. 
<laughs> so that I should pass any test to tell me what white people are doing. Yes, they're murdering, hanging. <laughs> <laughs> right, like, you get, I the, you know get the rhythm of it. And... <laughs> but we are saying to black people, it's culturally biased, but people who come from another culture can ace this test? You're telling them that you can be no more than what you currently are, and that's why you have generations of poverty. So you mentioned that you supported Trump. How powerful that, when he said in that speech when he talked about race, when he said, what do you have to lose? When I, I saw it live and I thought, I got what he was doing, but I thought it was, it was just, it felt to me, and this may be a little of my own liberal, it felt like a little too much to me. Because it was like, it was almost like, you, it's so horrible for you. When it's not horrible for everybody, obviously. Now, maybe he was talking about really, he was just zoning in on the people that are really in the inner cities that, that are, as you said, are under the thumb of these Democrat liberal policies and all that stuff. But, I, but you must have heard that and thought, holy shit, he, this is it. This he, guy said it. He's touching the mindset. Remember what we talked to leading up to here. That you have someone like Jesse Jackson come out and just speak, or Al Sharpton speak to black people and say, well, you're doing horrible in America. And even if somebody is, you think about it, you got these rappers who got Bentleys and making songs about how they're so rich, they, and they'll be like, yes, you're right. We're having a <laughs> horrible year. So it's the mindset of just because you're black, even when you're rich, you're gonna have a poor mindset. So if black people can tap into that and get blacks to feel like perpetual victims, even when they're doing well, i.e. what Jesse Williams, who has a white mother, stood up in front of the Oscars and said, we black people are magic. Like, what does your white mom do when you're saying this? She's like, <laughs> yeah, she's going, uh -oh. like somebody should have tapped her on the shoulder and said, get out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he still might be taking care of this white mom though. You know what I mean? Right. There, there might be something. No, but that's what I'm saying. It's a yeah. weird thing to even have to do that because half of you is black, the, uh, the whole of you is black, and you have to act like even your white side is still bad, and then the white people, because of liberal guilt, oh, I just slept with a black guy, that's all I did, and that was uh, my reparations. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's weird, and you watch this, this whole dynamic that's being put out there, so I liked when Donald Trump did it, because they're pushing that we all blacks have the same experience. You know if you're black, the comedian always talks about how rough his childhood was, mm -hmm. and the crowd said, yeah, my mama used to beat me with a curling iron, my mama beat me with an iron. Like, everybody's telling a story about how physically abusive their childhood was. Cosby used to do the thing about his wife coming in with the broom, beating them like it was a hockey stick. Yeah. So violence is the thing in these communities and everyone relates to it? So Donald Trump did what they were doing. Well, since they all relate to this, let me ask them the question, heck, I've done it in Dayton. I've told a girl, hey, I can't be any worse than the decisions you've made in the past. <laughs> and it works. That works? <laughs> yeah, it that does. Works. Yeah, a little bit low expectations. <laughs> but if you sit back and you think about it, he had to touch that. I was glad that he said it. Yeah. Because blacks are being told to continue to vote Democrat. But they're getting nothing from it. The black male, and again, well, I'm talking about males, so no one gives a crap about males. The black male job employment, unemployment was up to like 22 something percent under Barack Obama. And you talk about it, didn't break it up. So everybody was okay with black males not being able to get a job as long as black females can get a job? We're the only culture in America that's upside down, meaning the women run the, the society. The women are the power brokers. In the black community, the men, they don't have power. Through the 80s and 90s, black women were going on TV shows like Donahue, uh, Jesse Ra Sally Jesse Raphael saying, we're educated and we can't find any good men because the black men are either gay or in jail. <laughs> This was the 80s and the 90s. So black boys, how can you grow up to want to be a man when all you hear is, I don't need a man? You didn't even want to be a man. So Trump then, you, you liked it when you heard it. Now he has uh, Ben Carson, who's a neurosurgeon as the health, you know, you know, the, the uh, housing secretary, which is a little bizarre to me. Yes, because uh, he didn't want to be... He didn't want to be the Surgeon General. He said he wasn't qualified for that. Wait a minute, what? I know, this is a little confusing, <laughs> okay, right? Like, he seems like he would have been a little more qualified for that than the housing thing. But okay, I'll go with it. By the way, you could see a tremendous amount of that, that soft racism with liberals because Ben Carson, who again, I, the guy was a pretty terrible candidate. He always looks like he's sleeping, he speaks slowly, and all that stuff. But 
then Trump hires him, so a black man now moves up, you'd think the liberals would all be like this, but instead now he's a sellout and all, all the stuff that you were saying that you get called and, and all that. So okay, so putting that aside, so he's got Ben Carson, and then he has uh, Steve Harvey said, you know, he's gonna work with him and help the inner city. I suspect they're actually gonna do something. I think Trump is a businessman, and for all my reservations about him, I think he's probably gonna have them come up with some plan to go in there and do it. Have you seen any evidence of that yet? Well, here's a problem. Steve Harvey had to immediately switch right, so and turn he, against Donald Trump because he again was worried about being called a coon and had one of his friends, D.L. Hughley, call him out for just meeting with the guy, for just meeting with him. Now, mind you, they praised Dr. Martin Luther King, who just met with a president. That's all he did. The president, at the time, you didn't know what was going to happen. He met with them. And a lot of them were using him, the liberals, were using him as a well, we're benevolent to blacks and we love them. And behind the closed doors, they were saying, we'll have these niggers voting Democrat for the next 200 years. Now, mind you, they know this. They understand how the game is being played. But they turned this guy who just met with him against him to where he had to become one of his biggest allies. I don't like Trump now and, and I just went there and, and you know, yeah. just to appease this monolith called the black thought. So is, is Harvey not even working with him anymore on this? Nope. Is that, oh really, I didn't even know that part. So there you go. Well. Because of what the backlash he got from black people. Black people just feel like there's this one black guy, well, a few of them. They were supposed to be these pro-black guys, and they were telling black people, don't vote in the election. Your vote doesn't matter. So then Donald Trump wins, and they get upset. How does that make sense? You literally told people not to vote, so why should you care about the outcome? As a black person, if you're telling black people, do not vote, then you should not care about the outcome. By the way, not all of this is purely racial, because even a guy like the... Remember, was it the Uber CEO who met with Trump and then got a huge backlash? So then he he had to turn. Yep. He stepped away and said, "I'm not. I'm going to be off the Economic Advisory Council or whatever it was." So even that that goes to the the mindset of these people that in some ways supersedes race. Mm -hmm. you're, you're giving me a racial example there, but it goes to just a general. I think Elon Musk said something about that. He said something to the effect of. Guys, he's, you know, I'm loosely doing this, but he was like, look, he's president. I can affect more change if I'm in there with him rather than just screaming about it. So in a way, it's really just a, a complete lack of maturity, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's like, if you want to change things, just screaming and, and burning things down and, you know, stopping speakers and all that nonsense, that doesn't do anything except embolden your enemies. What does things is actually sitting with people that you don't like. Yeah, and they were asking for the liberal, I mean, the Republicans to do it under um, Barack Obama. You need to sit down with him and work with him. They're making it hard for him. Well, you're making it hard for Trump, and you're doing it on purpose, and you're doing it on Moss. All the little liberals are saying, let's just uh, make it difficult for Milo to be on a campus. Let's make it difficult for Tommy to be on YouTube. Let's make it difficult for any voice that may even ask the question, because a lot of us are just asking the question. Think about it. We're not out in the streets beating anyone. We're not advocating the beating of anyone. We're asking the question, is it as simple as how it's presented to us? Is it as simple as Trump is a racist? Is it as simple as uh, Republicans are xenophobes? It can't be that simple because I don't know what a xenophobe is, but <laughs> is it as simple yeah. as these things and asking these questions are shaking that tree and I guess the people who are in that tree hiding don't want to actually fall out. So they're going to do all they can to make you stop shaking that tree. The truth is what we should, and all of us should want as American citizens. And we all should want our president to kind of succeed. Because if the president succeeds, then truly we will succeed, right? Yeah, Sam Harris, who was completely against Trump, wrote a piece after the election or did a thing on his podcast where he said, look, now the guy is the pilot of the plane. You want that plane to crash? I don't think so. <laughs> and he was 100% against him. Mm -hmm. But we can't get that. I think this is what America's pushing. This whole find a way to divide people, race, class, gender, and it all, I mean, a lot of this stuff is preferences. Like you can't even have a preference around a liberal. A liberal um, homosexual says, well, you should accept my lifestyle. But if you say, well, I accept your lifestyle, I just don't want my kid to be one. Well, you're a bit. Well, wait a minute, I accept the fact that you wanna be homeless. I don't want my kid to be homeless. <laughs> I accept the fact that you wanna smoke crack. I don't want my kid to smoke crack. Hell, I have two daughters. I don't want them dating someone who's, who's poverty stricken. What does that make me? I don't understand that we can't even have a preference anymore. When life used to be about preferences and abilities, I, I have no problem with a white person saying, well, my granddad was white, my grandma was white, I kind of want my white kid to marry a white person. 
Why is that a problem? I don't understand no, that's that. Cause that's going to get you in a whole world of hurt for that. That's, that'll be the clip that people will take out of this and go, you see, now he's aligning with the uh, white nationalists or something. Yeah, but if you ever notice with black people, we could say it all the time. Black dudes get to stand up and say, I wouldn't date a white woman. He's praised for it. And he's going to say it in public. So why is it that we can say we want to keep our black first and black businesses? Why can we say that? But if anybody else says it, it's wrong. Why can you have black pride, brown pride, gay pride, but not white pride? Because that's racist. What do we do from here? What do we do from here? Like, I think most people, I think a lot, I know a lot of my audience is going to hear you, really hear you and go, this is the type of stuff that I think needs to be heard more. And I think that the group of people that are talking about this stuff is actually growing. I, I do mm -hmm. see this. At the same time, the people who don't want to hear us are getting more and more hysterical because that's all they got left. Where, where do you see all this going, especially in the framework of having Trump as president? We have to have more dialogue like this. I think when people see you and me, you and I. Uh oh well, now, <laughs> uh, well, I'm sure there was a systemic reason that you. Right, it's because yeah. of the way that racism worked. <laughs> But if you and I... Trust me, if they got all the linguistic things that I screw up here, I would, uh, it would not be pretty. <laughs> if people, more people like you and I, Crowder and all of us, uh, Mark Levine, all of us just got together. It doesn't matter what side we're on. If we could just have the conversation. Because Bill Maher used to be good at saying, let's just have the conversation. And I still like that he will call out those idiots, on the liberals on college campuses. But it's kind of the only reason he's calling them out is because they've affected him and his work. <laughs> so as long as they don't affect him and his work, he'll side with them. But if more of us could have these conversations and not have them in Jerry Springer style formats to where it's your liberal and I'm a conservative and we're gonna fight because we have more in common than the world wants us to believe. The bigger pit, the, the powers that be, they're wanting us to not have real dialogue. They're wanting black people to feel like white people are against you and you owe me something. Uh, Michael Larry Dyson, said, yes, I believe white people should pay. Uh, maybe you should give black people a computer. I, saw, or, I was you know, there, stupid you saw that on Bill Maher? I, is that where you're getting that yeah. from, or has he said it before? No, he said it on Bill Maher. Yeah, I was there that night in the audience, and I, and I saw this, everyone applauded when he said it, and I'm watching this woman, there was like a 60-year-old white woman in front of me applauding, yes, you should give a computer to a chief, <laughs> you should give a computer to a black kid. I'm looking around, all these people are applauding, there's virtually no black people in the crowd, I don't know, maybe, maybe a couple, but it's all white people. Yeah. Everyone's applauding, I'm looking around going, are any of you gonna give a computer to a black person? Like, you're all just doing it so you think you feel good about yourself. Yep. You're not really doing it, but I saw that line and I thought Bill was gonna go for him on it. And they, they, but he just, let they, it go. They, they just let it be. And I know as an interviewer, sometimes you let some things go. It's, it's just the nature of talking to people. And for him, he has you know, time constraints and all that. But I just thought it was hilarious. Give a, give a black kid a computer. Like I thought he was walking around going, well, well, he take my phone. You know, like, well, let me ask you, as a white person in the audience, yes. did you kind of look around to see if, is he joking? Like, is this a part where we laugh, or is he seriously saying we should? Everyone do it? applauded so quickly that there, if it was a joke, it was. I know. Well, we know it wasn't a joke, but you know. Because I would have thought, as a white person, but maybe he's playing with us right now. Because that makes no sense that we just walk out and give a random black kid a computer. <laughs> Look, it doesn't. By the way, for the record, in, in his defense, he was saying that he didn't believe that reparations were necessary in a traditional form. Mm -hmm. He was saying what you could do in your own personal life. But in a way, that made it funnier because then you have all them applauding and you know that none of them are giving away their MacBook. You know? Yeah, nobody's doing that. Maybe Everybody iPad, walks out and give out their iPhone. Just give it out when you walk out of here. Just you give it phone? to a blackhead. <laughs> with that, with that? I got three of them. I don't oh, believe. Uh, can but, I get one of yours? <laughs> but the funny thing is you're offering something to black kids that they already have. Even when they're poor, they already have access to the internet. Half of Twitter was black people, even though only 13% of, of society is black. They're spending a lot of time online. How do you think I keep getting flagged down? <laughs> it's not a shortage of black people online. <laughs> so why are they offering them something that they can't use? Something that is going to make what they're doing already worse. There's a movie out called, uh, or it's coming out this summer called uh, Girls Trip, starring Queen Latifah, I just want you to go and watch the, the trailer for it. It's one of the most disgusting trailers ever of these middle-aged black women saying all this sexually perverse stuff. And it's a trailer for a movie. And I'm watching and I felt, I could see myself sinking into my seat because I was at the movie theater with a bunch of white people. And they were laughing because they love to see those black girls be sassy. Well, that's ruining our community. And having a movie about them going around and having irresponsible sex, why would you need that in a group that's filled with STDs and single motherhood?
Why would you teach this? Why would that be the movie you put out? Because there's a mindset that's being pushed by these liberals to tell blacks. Basically, liberals are like the pets of, of black. Of, uh, blacks are the pets of liberals. They just like to have us around, but as long as they can feel above us, then it's cool. Because I've heard more racist comments come from liberal whites than conservative whites. And it will be all over small disagreements or ideologies. And I'm thinking, surely you could agree with me without calling me the N-word because you're liberal, right? Oh, well, that's how you're acting, so they'll justify it. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. But you're supposed to be above this. But apparently they're not when it comes to disagreement of ideologies. Yeah. Listen, we could go on and on, but unfortunately I got another interview to do. So we're going to leave this. I didn't look down once, which I always say is a good sign of a solid interview. Uh, so one more thing for you, and then I'm going to direct people to where to find you, but we don't even know if these places are going to exist by the time we post this because YouTube's bumping you and Twitter's bumping you and everything else. You are uh, doing a movie about this, right? Did you raise some money on a movie? To, yeah, to, called to, A Fatherless America. Yeah. And it should be out this summer, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we're talking about and not just blacks, just a fatherless America, how fathers are being pushed out of the lives of their children. And it's become a norm that a child does not need his father. When you are married to a woman, you see your kids every day. You get a divorce, you see your kids every other weekend. How's that fair? That the judge goes into it and the mother has to be a complete horrible parent for the father to have any chance to get full custody. No. When many, many men in America would take full custody of their children and not even ask for child support. No. Are th the way you're doing the movie, are you transcending race on that? Because that actually yeah. is a male thing, because I, that yes. is probably just as equal in the, in the white community, right? Yeah, I had plenty of white males who were on the streets, and uh, I went all, all across the United States, and many of them talked about how society was, was messing them up. One guy, I, we helped him out for my show, uh, he was looking for $2,000 just to get a car because they had, were going to repo his old car. He couldn't afford to pay for it. He was married, got a divorce, had two children. He was getting from his check, he was getting a total of $51 after they took all this. So he couldn't even afford a car. And while he put up his GoFundMe, it had been up five months when I found it, he had $375 in five months when he was just asking for a, a drive-around car because they were going to take his car. Within three days, we got him $8,000. And this was a white guy, and he was struggling because he said his wife, when she left, she took the kids and went to another state. He hadn't seen them in years. And this is a story that a lot of men are telling, black, white, or other. But no one cares that these men can't see their, ki their kids. They say, well, just keep fighting. You should spend all of your money to keep fighting. This guy, uh, one guy in the movie, went from living in a mansion to living in a studio apartment after a divorce. His wife still lives in the mansion, though. But he has to pay the same amount of money he was paying two years ago, even though his job got downgraded. Because the judge says, you have the potential to make that money, so I'm not going to change how much you have to pay in child support. Wow. Well, listen, it's powerful stuff, and I, I love doing this because I think a lot of this, it flips conventional thinking on its head, which is what most people need a little bit of because people are so locked into the way they think. So let's get you back on when the movie comes out for sure. All right. And uh, we'll keep the conversation going. And for you guys, hopefully his YouTube channel still exists by the time we post this, but it's youtube.com slash Sotomayor TV 2. Or, or yes, go to, you I mean, take it away. Yes, or you guys can find me on my website, which they haven't figured out a way to take down yet, and that's <laughs> SotomayorTV.com, or just TommySotomayor.com, and it will take you to me. Done and done. <laughs>